Okay, so good afternoon once again. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for joining us for the first um, meeting of our seminar series, uh, which we call by a sh short title, very similar to our conference title. Uh, so the title of the series is Early Modern Metaphors of Knowledge. As you know, I, I believe all of you uh, were among uh, planned participants of the conference, which was uh, scheduled for uh, the last September. So it's not uh, it's not uh, necessary to explain in any detail why we postponed the conference. It was, of course, because of the pandemic of COVID-19. We, uh, together with uh, Lenka Řezníková and Petr Pavlas, and uh, with support of the Department of Comenius Studies and Early Modern Intellectual History Institute of Philosophy, uh, we intended to organize a conference last late September, early October 2020. Uh, it was entitled uh, Between the Labyrinth of the uh, uh, Between the Labyrinth and the Weight of Light, Early Modern Metaphors of Knowledge and Johannes Amos Comenius. And uh, of course, the aim of the conference was primarily um, to discuss and analyze a variety of, of metaphors representing um, scholarship, learning, and knowledge in the early modern period, in early modern scholarly discourse. Um, um, and we planned to focus on, on multiplicity, uh, various functions, and ambivalent standings of, of metaphor as such in uh, uh, different uh, scholarly and literary discourses of the period. Uh, the second aim of the conference was to commemorate uh, the anniversary of, of the death of Johannes Amos Comenius. Uh, and of course, Comenius, uh, uh, like many of his, his contemporaries, was, was famous for uh, making use of, of, of a very rich figurative language he employed in his uh, treatises, in his works, both Latin um, works and, and Czech works, uh, um, um, great number of metaphors uh, through which he uh, conceptualized uh, knowledge, uh, learning, memory, uh, and of course, uh, 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 religion, um, the universe, uh, human beings, etc., etc. Uh, so we were forced to postpone uh, this conference until September of this year, and we very much hope that we will be able to meet you all uh, in Prague in person, not only online. But in the meantime, as you know, we started with the preparation of uh, and the edited volume for the publishing house Brill. Uh, we are extremely enthusiastic because we received uh, excellent contributions and we are working on them. Uh, we ordered some um, peer reviews and we are working uh, in, the, uh, in the editing of these texts. Uh, with some of you, we have been back in touch already with some of you we will be uh, but we also promised to organize a sort of this online meetings to discuss uh, uh, the topics which uh, or the texts which were prepared for this edited volume and so uh, this is the first of our meetings uh, we will meet uh, every thursday at five o'clock p.m uh, at least for the next, at least until the end of May, uh, for the next couple of weeks, um, I will uh, specify the program or distribute the program 
over um, uh, this coming weekend so you will see the 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 very schedule of it because until now i have been um, i have been in touch with individual individual speakers uh, that much for the uh, for the general introduction uh, as for the today's meeting, we will have uh, two uh, speakers. Um, each of them um, will talk about 20 minutes and we expect uh, the general discussion to both of these papers afterwards. Uh, let me introduce our two speakers today. Uh, uh, Professor Paul Richard Bloom um, is Emeritus Professor uh, of Philosophy from the Loyola University, Maryland. Uh, his career, of course, is um, very distinguished. He, uh, uh, he focused in his uh, voluminous uh, works especially on uh, philosophy in the Renaissance, but also uh, on history of philosophy in general. He dealt in detail with Jesuit and modern scholastic philosophy. He covered uh, philosophy of nature, uh, philosophy of history. He dealt also with uh, philosophical anthropology, uh, the, the the very fascinating topic of of the anthropology of slavery and uh, he published uh, a number of uh, books and uh, articles uh, to mention at least some of them um, of course the works about giordano bruno which is the topic um, uh, uh, richard bloom is focused on since the times of his doctoral studies, I believe. Uh, and to mention just a few of the titles, uh, he published uh, uh, an introduction to, to Giordano Bruno as, as philosopher. Um, the volume Giordano Bruno teaches Aristotle. Um, uh, Richard dealt also uh, in one of his uh, recent monographs uh, with, uh, with the figure of Nicolas of Cusa and the topics of peace, religion, and wisdom in the broader context of, of Renaissance philosophy. Uh, so this is just, uh, just very few topics which I uh, wanted, uh, wanted to mention. As for our second speaker today, um, Tomasz Machula, uh, is a uh, assistant professor, if I'm right, at the South Bohemian uh, University in České Budějovice. He uh, was trained as uh, philosopher and theologian. Uh, he deals um, in his uh, studies, especially with uh, medieval and early modern scholastics. Um, uh, his uh, central topic is the teaching of Thomas Aquinas, and uh, he published uh, also a number of uh, books and, and articles on these topics, including uh, uh, De Eternitate Mundi uh, of Thomas Aquinas in, in historical perspective, uh, and uh, uh, the book uh, uh, discussing from philosophical perspective the question of Christian faith and rationality. So to mention just uh, just few of uh, of Tomas's uh, uh, works. Now, uh, I believe I propose that we uh, would start with uh, first with uh, Tomas Machula because he will talk. Um, uh, also about Thomas Aquinas, uh, so there is some connection between medieval period and early modern period, and then we will move uh, 
within this paper, we will move to the early modern period and Richard Bloom will continue the, the, the topic of the early modern period. So Tomáš uh, will speak about uh, um, scripture, metaphors and theology in, Aqu in Aquinas and his early modern commentators. And Richard Bloom uh, will introduce us to uh, the topic uh, or, or to his paper on Giordano Bruno called God and as his own metaphor, God as his own metaphor, creating images according to Giordano Bruno. So Tomáš, uh, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, for your presentation uh, of uh, not only my, but uh, also my uh, topic. Uh, I will try to share uh, the screen. Uh, I hope, is it okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much. So my topic, uh, my short presentation. Maybe, is... sorry, maybe if you can, if you can just push F5 to. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So uh, my short presentation is focused on uh, discussions of metaphors in the Bible, uh, in the writings of Aquinas and his early modern commentators. Uh, Aquinas considers the topic of metaphors uh, in scripture in the first question of his Summa Theologiae. It means in the very beginning of his uh, most uh, important Summa. His Renaissance and early modern followers have commented this text in the close relation to the topic of four senses of the scripture that is discussed uh, in this, uh, in the next article uh, to the article of metaphors. It's a first question and ninth and tenth articles. Let us note the commentaries of Aquinas Summa are a typical literary genre in the, uh, at the universities, especially among Dominicans and Jesuits. Franciscans held different strategy because they ordered their philosophical and theological treatises rather at mentem scoti, with respect to their most important Franciscan thinker in high middle ages, John Duns Scotus. Uh, so we can start with Aquinas text where he distinguishes literal and spiritual sense of the scripture. Uh, it's uh, from the 10th article of the first question of the Summa. The author of Holy Scripture is God, in whose power it is to signify his meaning, not by words only, as men also can do, but also by things themselves. So whereas in every other science, things are signified by words, this science, it means theology, has the property that the things signified by the words have themselves also a signification. Therefore, that first signification whereby words signify things belongs to the first sense, the historical or literal. That signification whereby things signified by words have themselves also a signification is called the spiritual sense which is based on the literal and presupposes it. God, who is the author of scripture, doesn't create only words as human beings do, but also the things as such. It means he gives the meaning both to words and things. The sense of words describing things, including events, is a matter of literal or historical sense while the sense of words describing things that describe other things is a matter of spiritual sense. In other words, God doesn't use only words, but also things in communication with people. And what is why things are described not only by words, but also by other things. We can describe it briefly and clearly by the following diagram. It is clear that literal sense is primary and fundamental. He is, uh, how to say it, omnipresent. And the spiritual sense depends 
on this literal sense and cannot be without it. Aquinas obviously follows the old tradition of the biblical exegesis that distinguishes principally literal and allegorical sense, especially Alexandrian tradition that comprises, for example, Philo in the Judaist stream and much younger Oregon, uh, origin in the Christian stream. In the course of patristic period and early medieval period, the doctrine of four senses of scripture was gradually developed, that is poetically described in the famous quatrain by Dominic and Augustine of Dacia, uh, it's 13th century. The latter teaches events, allegory, what you should believe, morality teaches what you should do, and anagogy, what mark you should be aiming for. According to Aquinas, allegory consists in relationship between Old Testament and New Testament reality. Moral sense consists in relationship between Christ's life and our life. And anagogical sense consists in relationship between present and future world. It must be said, however, the spiritual sense could be found also in the New Testament, of course. For example, in the contemporary stream of deep psychological exegesis tries to present and use. Literal sense is only one, and it presents the primary intention of the author. In the case of scripture, it's the author of scripture, and in uh, Christianity, it's uh, primarily God, and secondary, it is uh, uh, the holy person who, uh, who wrote uh, the scripture according to uh, divine inspiration. This literal sense comprises truths that are necessary for salvation and only the scriptural propositions in this sense can be used in the theological arguments and proofs. The other senses are secondary. They help us, but they do not comprise truths that are necessary for salvation and that are not presented in other places in the literal sense. Literal sense, however, does not simply equal to the plain common meaning of the used words. It can be divided into several kinds. As an example of Aquinas commentators, we can quote Jesuit author Louis de Molina, uh, he died in 1604, who says that the sense of scripture is nothing but what the author of the scripture, either closely or remotely, intended to denote, or precisely what Holy Spirit himself, who is the principal author of scripture, intended to denote. Then he gives some examples of particular senses of scripture from the 16th chapter of prophet Ezekiel, where Jerusalem is addressed. Jerusalem can be understood in the following senses, literal as a town in Palestine, allegorical, the church of the New Testament, moral, the soul of a Christian, and anagogical, the church triumphant or church in heavens. We can see the primary sense is always Jerusalem as the town and other senses are derived from this literal sense. The word signifies the town and the town signifies the earthly church or soul or heavenly church. In the above mentioned schematic description of the distinction between literal and spiritual sense of scripture, the example of Jerusalem can be depicted in the following way. It is necessary to say Aquinas is well aware of some, uh, of some inconsistency of terminology because both some patristic authors and some medieval authors use a little different terminology. Uh, I, uh, I told you uh, that uh, these uh, quatrain, these four uh, senses of scripture uh, is a, a medieval, uh, medieval concept. And uh, Aquinas predecessors, for example, here uh, are Augustine and Hugh of St. Victor, uh, who are mentioned in the text of the Summa, 
have a different uh, structure of uh, these letters or, or literal and spiritual sense. According, according of Aquinas, there is one literal or historical, it's the same, it's a synonym sense, and three spiritual senses. Augustine called this literal uh, sense uh, by three words as historical, etiological, or analogical, and uh, the whole complex of spiritual senses uh, uh, is called allegorical uh, sense, according to Augustine. Hugh is um, uh, a little bit, um, a little bit uh, um, simple, historical, allegorical, and tropological sense. Strictly speaking, the literal sense is not common meaning of the used words, but it is a reality described by these words. The words can be used both in their proper sense and in the figurative sense. Not every figurative proposition, however, is a matter of spiritual sense. Literal sense is the sense that the author himself has given to his words and it can be even a figurative proposition. Uh, Thomas uh, speaks about so-called uh, so-called uh, 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 parabolical sense, and uh, he uh, he commented uh, it by these words. The parabolical sense is contained in the literal form by words things are signified properly and figuratively. Nor is the figure itself but that which is figured, the literal sense. When scripture speaks of God's arm, the literal sense is not that God has such a member, but only what is signified by this member, namely operative power. So now, uh, together with Jesuit second scholasticism, author uh, Gabriel Vasquez, it's a big, the end of uh, 16th and the beginning of uh, 17th century, we can say that the existence of the mystical or spiritual sense and the literal sense of scripture was accepted by all Catholic authors, but there is not full consent to what these senses precisely mean and how they are structured. Literal sense of the text must be only one because it is just the idea of the author. It means there is only one literal sense of particular proposition. Some commentators distinguish two types of literal sense, but uh, this does not contradict its unity. Each statement has only one literal sense that is either this or that type. The most important Jesuit scholastic author, Francisco Suarez, describes the two types of literal senses in the following way. Proper, proprius, signifies immediately words in the proper signification, and other, quem silicet verba immediate redunt in metaphorica significazione. Suarez states a priority must be done to the proper sense, unless competent authority decides otherwise. The competent authority in the case of scripture, of course, is uh, the church. Uh, if, uh, because uh, we must avoid big doubts in the case of biblical exegesis. Uh, similarly, Dominican author Francisco de Araujo, it's uh, uh, the half of 17th century, insists on the unity of, of literary sense, and he considers other senses to be acceptable only if they do not contradict good morals. Suarez notes this metaphorical sense is called also spiritual sense in some authors, but it is not right according to him. Spiritual sense is signified by things or events and not by words, while metaphorical sense is directly signified by words, albeit in their oblique metaphorical sense. Other important Jesuit author, Louis de Molina, it's uh, the end of 16th century, distinguishes the two types of literal sense as proper and transitive. Important second scholasticism Thomist, Dominican John Poinsot, 
uh, it's a uh, first half of 17th century, or John of St. Thomas, advocates the same idea. He, uh, in his words, metaphors are called statements in improper sense or suppositions where the word signifies one thing and is accommodated to the second thing that is not signified in the proper sense, but in some similitude, comparison, or uh, translation. Metaphor comprises parables, tropes, similitudes, and enigmas. They signify a thing not in the proper sense, but in a detour. Metaphorical or parabolic sense belong to literal sense because it is based on meaning of word and not things, but in a shift, translative, and metaphorically. In the case of scripture, parables and metaphors are directly literal sense. So we can sum up this understanding of metaphor in the following points and examples. Uh, improper, metaphor is improper, transitive, or other type of literal sense. It is not based on literal, but it is literal. And it is the thing author wants to say. Uh, some uh, scriptural, uh, scriptural uh, uh, quotations, my father, it's, it's uh, from the John's gospel and Jesus says, my father is a wine grower. It means it's a metaphor. It is, it is a literal sense is uh, that uh, God, the father cares about people as a wine grower cares about uh, wine. Matthew, uh, a good gospel according to Matthew, if you hand or food causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life maimed or crippled than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. I think uh, may maybe it was, it was clear for everybody except uh, Origenes that it's, uh, it's a metaphor. It's, it's not a, a proper sense of, of words. And Revelation, the lion of the tribe Judah has triumphed. The lion of uh, Judah is a uh, title of uh, Jesus. Uh, on the other hand, for example, Isaac carrying wood for a holocaust, according to the book of Genesis 22, that is literal sense of the story, has a parallel with Christ who carried his cross, but it is not a metaphor, it is spiritual sense, because uh, the Jesus uh, uh, carrying the cross uh, uh, denotes uh, the something, not, not the word. It means one event uh, causes uh, or uh, denotes the other event. The basis of spiritual sense, says uh, Louis de Molina, is always literal sense. And the literal sense of any spiritual sentence is one and only one, as Aquinas stated. His commentators usually do not cast doubt upon it. Literary sense must be only one because it is the sense immediately intended by the author of the text. If literal sense could multiply, there would be no certainty which sense was intended by the author. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, there is no problem with many spiritual senses under one literal sense. God, who is the principal author of scripture, has perfect and comprehensive knowledge, says uh, Thomas de Vio uh, or Cardinal Caetan, uh, so, uh, there is, uh, so that there is everything comprised in one divine intellect. There is a real distinction of particular senses, however, in the human beings. And uh, we, can, we can say a couple of words about a very interesting question that was raised by Franciscan author Nicolas of Lyra, a medieval author. Uh, he uh, doesn't accept a metaphor as a part of literal sense, and uh, it has consequences. If some sentences cannot be obviously understood in their proper signification, and if metaphor doesn't belong to the literal sense, there is no other way but admitting that some parts of scripture do not have any literal sense at all. 
second scholastic authors extensively argue against such position. For example, Vasquez criticized Franciscan author Nicolas of Lira, who told the view in his postilla that some sentences of the scriptures do not have any literal sense, but only the spiritual sense. As an example, uh, he quoted uh, the verse from Sir Matthew, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, and uh, uh, I, I quoted it um, uh, just before. They have no literal, but uh, according to Nicholas, uh, these have no literal, but only the spiritual sense. The reason is evident absurdity of reading these verses in their proper meaning, it means literal sense. It means uh, Nicolas of Lyra uh, do, not, uh, do not accept the metaphor as a part of literal sense. Vasquez finds similar doctrine also in Spanish theologian Alonso Tostado from 15th century, who was called Abulenzis. Vasquez criticized the inner contradiction in this position because Tostado and Nicolas has two incompatible understanding of the literal sense in, this, in his exposition of Matthew Gospel. The first one is the standard doctrine of Aquinas and his commentators, it's the first. Uh, the second one is close to Nicholas of Lyra. These two understanding we have here, the first literal sense as the intention of the author, and it is either in the closed sense it means proper, and in a remote sense, it means meta metaphor or parable and so on. Uh, Aquinas called this, calls uh, this sense parabolic sense because it's typical for Jesus' parables. For example, uh, um, it's, okay. the second, uh, uh, second possibility is literal sense as that what words as such directly ex express where there is not in this literal sense, it is neither in the intention of Holy Spirit who is the author of the text. And uh, the first understanding is correct and traditional. The second is the position of Nicholas of Lyra and uh, to Alonso Tostado, who is criticized by, uh, by Vasquez, has both positions in his writings and it is not possible because it, it contradicts so we can uh, we can um, we can see uh, the uh, small table that is extending of uh, Rodrigo de Arriaga, Prague's uh, uh, famous professor of Prague uh, from the 17th century, and Arriaga follows Vasquez's argumentation in his commentary. The terminological elaborating of various kinds of the literal sense can be found. They are following senses. Oh, sorry. Uh, moral, it contains some advices for our life. Historical, it contains narration of events. Prophetical, it contains a vision of the future. Ornate, it contains praises. And other senses according to various matters. Uh, we are confronted with the question whether metaphorical language is suitable for scripture and theology. It is the core of Aquinas text in the Summa. Aquinas understands metaphorical language as both useful and necessary. Expression of intelligible truths is possible only through sensible things for human beings in the state of this, of, uh, uh, this uh, earthly life. You can read uh, the text, it is, it is clear, I think. Aquinas understands using of metaphors in the Bible as suitable and reasonable because it is in accordance with human nature and the order of human knowledge that begins in the senses. He is consistent Aristotelian in this point so that he insists of necessity of phantasms derived from sensual knowledge for intellectual formation of concept. It's a famous uh, principle that uh, everything that is in the intellect must be uh, before uh, in the senses. To explain spiritual reality, it is very useful to compare these 
unimaginable and purely intelligible spiritual concepts to the things that are well known from our sensual experience and that are accessible to our imagination. Kaitan notes that according to Aquinas, scripture uses metaphors propter utilitatem et necessitatem, it means uh, because of utility and necessity. Utility is mentioned there because there is connaturality, uh, the natural uh, likeness of man and sensible things. Scripture thus doesn't use metaphors because of some necessity, but because of utility. Kaitan states scriptures, uh, scripture uses metaphor with and without necessity. It is necessary not because of uneducated people, but because of the state of this life. It is to help man reach a better knowledge of God. But it is not necessary absolutely, simpliciter. Uh, there are phantasms that are necessary for knowledge or of intelligible things and not metaphors. So the last thing that is, uh, that is uh, interesting uh, in this context is unsuitable use of metaphors. We can uh, describe it by uh, the text of Domingo Bagnes, a famous uh, Dominican author uh, of early modern period. Metaphor is really needful, but, uh, but uh, the excessive pleasure from metaphors could be uh, problematic because uh, uh, Banyas, Banyas uh, quoted two uh, or uh, Banyas uh, described two uh, cases of excessive, of uh, unsuitable use of metaphors. First is excessive pleasure. It's, it's a typical for, uh, for uh, um, Alexandrian exegesis in the patristic period, for example, origin and Judaic exegesis concentrated, concentrated only to the proper sense. I think uh, it must be commented a little because Aquinas thinks uh, or speaks not only about uh, uh, Judaic exegesis as such, but uh, he has a problem because, uh, because Jews, of course, uh, doesn't, uh, do, do, not, uh, do not accept the a New Testament view to the Old Testament. It means uh, the Old Testament is uh, seen as such, as a literal, in, in, in its literal sense, and it is not, uh, it is not possible, according to them, uh, to, uh, uh, to have the Old Testament as a starting point of a spiritual reading from the point of view of New Testament. It means there is no place of uh, prefiguration of, of uh, Christ. And I think this uh, issue that is very interesting in um, high medieval and uh, early modern period also, uh, to, it is topical also today because uh, these discussions could be an inspiration both for contemporary biblical fundamentalists and for anti-Christian, uh, improper anti-Christian criticism uh, the, both is uh, both is based on uh, problematic uh, reading of the senses of the scripture as a, uh, the beginning of Genesis with sun and moon are seen as the lamps in the heavenly uh, heavenly floor and uh, Jonah and whale and so on and so on. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope it, uh, I, I am in time maybe a little longer. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tomasz, uh, for, for this uh, very, very inspirative overview of the classical Thomistic position on, on uh, metaphors and um, in the context of, uh, of, the, of the teaching on four uh, senses of scripture and uh, the, especially the overview of the early modern uh, authors on that. Uh, now I th I see some hands raised. I originally I thought there there can be a discussion after the second paper, but if I, you prepare to do so, yes, I, I meant that as applause. As as what? Applause. A, a, applause. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. My <laughs> my mistake. My mistake. There was another applause. I I saw more hands. So yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was mine. That was also a plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for misunderstanding. Um, so uh, thank you once again. Um, we will move now to uh, to our second speaker, Richard Bloom. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for organizing the whole thing. And we are all looking for, um, forward to the incarnation of that conference in reality. Um, <clears throat> um, my, my topic is the, um, the creation of images in Giordano Bruno, which amounts to the absolute metaphor of God as himself, his own metaphor. And let me, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and allow me to start with a reference to the Holy Scripture. I need to share my screen now. Um, in the um, oratorian uh, theologian Louis Thomasin of the 17th century. Okay, well, let me um, just briefly um, outline what my paper is, um, how my paper is structured. I will talk about the Holy Scripture as a metaphor. Uh, then we speak about object and subject of met metaphors, <clears throat> images as research tools, about producing images as creation, and the consequence of infinite semantics, and then uh, concluding speaking about absolute metaphors. So the Holy Scripture is in and of itself a metaphor, and now I have to change the view so that I can see what I, I'm sorry, I have to do something here. Okay, so that I can read my own text. Okay, okay, so um, Louis Thomasin, uh, says the scriptures present divine things not as being beyond but as clouded in bodily coverings. What else is this than corporealizing God and incarnating the wisdom of the word? The works of the philosophers about God testify were the same. Who was ever able to make words about God if not? <clears throat> if not by way of metaphors and allegories with recourse to material symbols. So if it is true that human reasoning is unable to realize and that thus reify the theological truth, then it is God who has to materialize and incarnate in order to make himself known to humanity. Scripture itself is a reification of God and hence of double nature, divine and human. And metaphor is God's specific way to communicate, reveal himself uh, to the world. The fundamental task is to reconstruct the way in which the transcendent realizes and manifests itself in the human world. This approach, this is 17th century, is pretty similar to what Giordano Bruno uh, was intending in his uh, dealing with metaphors and images. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah. Um, I quote from his um, dialogue, Spaccio della Bestia Triumphante. <coughs> Uh, where in which Sophia, wisdom, says, thus truth is before all things, is with all things, is after all things, is above all, with all, after all. She is ideal, natural, and notional. She is metaphysics, physics, and logic. Above all things, then, is truth. Because of this, then, Jove reasonably has desired that in the most imminent place of the heaven, truth should be seen. <clears throat> but certainly this 
which you sensibly see and which you at the height of your intellect can understand is not the highest at first, but a certain figure, a certain image, a certain splendor of the one that is superior to this Jove about whom we often speak and Jove who is the subject of our metaphors. Wisdom discourses about truth and she does so from the lofty perspective of truth itself. Therefore, she first establishes its natural dwelling and then shows how truth reaches out to humans. Manifestations of truth are truth nonetheless, but it is truth that approaches understanding. Here enters Jove as the one who placed truth in the imminent position where it can be seen. Once it is, this is established, wisdom is prepared to explain um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah, wisdom is it a, a prepared to explain that all levels of perception and understanding are by necessity only der derivatives of truth. Um, let us see the continuation of that conversation. Why, O Sophia, does prudence follow her? Sophia answers that goddess who is joined to and next to truth has two names, providence and prudence. She is called providence in as much as she influences and is present in the superior principles. And she is called prudence in as much as she is realized in us. So human prudence is a derivative of uh, divine providence. As Bruno says, Jove is the soggetto of the metaphoric play in this allegory. The God mediates between the one and its representations in the central world. Not only is the one and highest truth present in figures, images, and splendor, it is this God that established such metaphysical and cognitive order. Jove is not only the God of wisdom and truth, he is in this function and capacity a metaphor. That is, he is the metaphor for truth being divine. In the divine, divine realm, truth and metaphor coincide. <clears throat> so images as research tools. In his treatise of the torch of combinatorics, Rumor suggests that orators, poets, and prophets should use metaphors, that is, translations, for any term that may occur by way of similarities, proportions, negations, or other methods. It should be noted here that translatio was the Latin traditional rendering of the Greek term metaphora. So we see that Bruno is exploiting the shift in meaning from indirect speech to transforming content. If metaphoric speech is a sort of translation, then the method and rules of translation need to be explored. In 30 sigils, uh, where he explained the, that Phidias, the ancient sculptor, stands for imagination, fan fantasia. <clears throat> he says, fantasy is able to ascribe anything to anything and imagination grafts anything out of anything. You see, uh, the fantasy and imagination are separate as concepts. One is going down and the other is going up. The correct and appropriate usage of metaphoric expressions and explanations depends on the understanding of the inherent correlation between things, between degrees of being and understanding, and between the very relationship um, of reality, nature, with thought. Bruno's later work, The Torch of 30 Statues, Lampas Vigenta Statuarum, opens with the relation between the soul and the body. The soul, the soul's truth is food. 
anime veritatem est sibum consta. What is food for the body is truth for the soul. Truth in the soul is ever evolving and growing. That is, yeah. If that is the case, we can move over to producing images, which is a kind of creation. In his later work on composing images, signs, and ideas, Imaginum Signorum et Idearum Compositione, Bruno gives advice on how to produce mental representations as they are helpful in the process of finding, structuring, and memorizing. Idea, imagination, assimilation, configuration, designation, notation, all this is the task of God, nature, and mind. By the analogy between these, the divine action is what nature admirably reports. And then, while at the same time aiming at the loftier realm, nature's operation is what the human mind emulates. God moves nature, and nature inspires understanding. Bruno makes a quasi-pantheistic proposition. Whereas the natural eye sees everything but itself, God's eye sees all things but sees uh, and thus sees itself <clears throat> because he is the one who sees in himself everything and is identically everything. That is a consequence of this analogy of God, nature, and mind. When the human mind exercises its basic functions, such as using and speculating about numbers, it inevitably reconstructs natural processes and by analogy, nature reenacts divine uh, creation. So in the, uh, in the language of music and harmony, Bruno says in the same text, <clears throat> the effective light of truth forces us to perceive the triple music that rises from the order of things. One and first in the mind of God, the second in the order and movement of things, the third in the imprint of the forms with which our mind imbibes itself from these objects by virtue of that harmony of which, according to the doctrine of Pythagoreans and Platonists, it first benefited, that is, of which it was master, before being imprisoned in the bonds of body. Once again, it is truth that imposes itself on the understanding, but it does so in the form of harmony. The text closes uh, with by stating that The order of the rational world stands in similitude with the natural world, of which it is the shadow, which then is the image of the divine, of which it is the vestige. The human mind turns out to be itself that power that produces images, for there is such effectiveness that resides in the soul. Hence follows something like an infinite semantics. <clears throat> that is especially expressed in uh, the heroic chifuroi, heroic frenzies. This work is an exemplification of the way metaphors, allegories, imagery, and figurative speech can be used. It is an exercise in conceptualizing metaphor as such and is showcasing its theoretical function so that the work is not a plain piece of poetry, but a theoretical program of metaphoric uh, transformation of ideas or translation. The archetype of the hero in, in the dialogue is Acteon, the hunter after a stag meeting the goddess Diana who becomes devoured by his hounds. Acteon, with those thoughts, those dogs, that sought outside of themselves the good, the wisdom, the beauty, 
that is the, in the metaphor of wild woodland. And in such a way that he came to the presence of the one raptured out of himself by so much beauty, turned into a prey, seeing himself converted into what he sought. And he noticed that from his dogs, from his thoughts, he himself came to be cover, the coveted prey because having already contracted it in himself, it was not necessary to seek outside of himself the divinity. Translation here means more than converting from one language or fashion of speech to another. It involves a transfer from one ontological realm or idea to another. Between the concrete that is aiming at uh, a truth outside of itself and the truth captured inside of itself, denying constantly ever to be captured. There is no God beyond human language and learning, but only the indwelling of the absolute in the concrete, so that even God is as at best a metaphor of the effectiveness and deficiency of divine uh, of finite semantics. This is best expressed in the common assumption that the world is a, as a creation reveals the creator. In the same way as the hunter becomes the endless act of hunting, so also the divine, <coughs> also the divine never ceases to allure and haunt the human mind by means of representations. And that can be best explained or uh, expressed in the um, uh, concept of the absolute metaphor that Hans Blumenberg has developed a while ago. He famously discovered that in addition to metaphors plain and simple, there are also absolute metaphors, specifically philosophical theology cannot avoid such metaphors that while aiming beyond the surface of the image, cannot reach the ultimate referent if that is the unspeakable God. Metaphor then is all there is. God appears to be his own image. Uh, Blumenberg uh, explains that at the concept of the world soul and uh, with the help of Nicholas of Cusa, um, we can say Bruno stated that imagination in all its form is God's as well as nature's method insofar as the mind can emulate it. Therefore, images are not second rate cognitions where rationality fails, rather concept of reason <clears throat> Uh, are to be seen as images and consequently they share the properties of imagination such as relationality. Bruno retains the metaphysical singularity that consists in the inevitability of imagery when speaking about the absolute and its manifestations. The universe is the absolute metaphor of there being reality and as the theologian Thomasin confirmed, God is conceivable only as creating this all comp comprehensible metaphor. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, there will be an applause, <laughs> both, <laughs> both visual and uh, unfortunately not, not uh, audition. Uh, now, thank you for this uh, fascinating tour through <coughs> Giordano Bruno's uh, uh, discussion of, of, of a sort of theoretical, as you call that theoretical program of metaphoric transformation of ideas, uh, the, the topic of uh, 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 producing images and creating images, etc. And now I would like uh, to open the discussion to both of uh, our today's papers. Thank you once again. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Petr Pavlas. 
Thank you. Thank you. I will break the ice. Uh, thank you both, uh, Tomáš and uh, Richard, for your papers. And I have one question uh, to each of you. Um, my first question is uh, on Tomáš's paper. Uh, how how does uh, how does the uh, lit the conception of uh, metaphor or metaphorical sense as as a kind or a sort of literal sense? Uh, how does it match with uh, the theory of analogical concept uh, in Aquinas or uh, because I, if I'm right, I think Aquinas somehow try to to find the middle way between the univocal and equivocal concepts, and the the analogical concept is is a way how to ensure a unity of a concept. That means that the analogical uh, uh, concept, which we speak of God and of the creature of a creature, is not uh, uh, can can be a, a some some fund foundation of rational discourse or of syllogisms or so and so on uh, how, how how does this uh, theory of analogy in thomism i mean in aquinas and in early modern thomism how does it how, how is it connected with the biblical uh, with the principles of biblical exegesis uh, according to the four senses of scripture and according to the to the interpretation of uh, metaphors in scripture as literal sense. That, that's my question. And the second question uh, is on uh, Richard. Uh, can it be? Can it be? Uh, comp can can it be understood? Uh, the, the title of your paper: the uh, God as His Own Metaphor. Uh, can it be understood? Also, as not, not only in this in the way that uh, according to Bruno uh, and Blumenberg, and not according to Bruno, I, I would say uh, uh, the word God uh, has uh, an unspeakable denotate or a referent. So uh, the word God is is a metaphor. This is this is the the first meaning of of uh, the title God as his own metaphor. And the second sense which, uh, which uh, comes to my mind is uh, whether it can be understood as, in the sense that the word God is his own metaphor. That means it is not our, our mind's metaphor, but that is his own metaphor. That means revealed revealed metaphor. So these are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Petr. Uh, yes, Tomáš. Answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for for very very interesting question. Uh, uh, it surprised me a little because uh, this type of problem is not mentioned uh, uh, neither in Aquinas uh, nor in uh, his um, commentators. I think it is because uh, there are two separate uh, separate issues. Uh, analogical predication means, for example, uh, is, uh, is a relation between the term and reality. What kind of reality uh, it denotes, uh, this, this term? Uh, but uh, I think, uh, for example, the term life, it's a typical, uh, typical uh, example of analogical concept. Uh, life, uh, it's one concept and it can be predicated or that it can be used uh, both for a human being and for, uh, I don't know, a tree uh, or a dog and so on. And, so on. and if, uh, if uh, the scripture uh, speaks about life, the lit what, what, is, what is it, the literal sense? I think literal sense of this word in the biblical context is, uh, uh, depends uh, depends to the context of its uh, of this place. If uh, God uh, gives you a new life, it's uh, it, it is life, but it's a little bit different meaning than 
and uh, God creates a lot of creatures with uh, uh, that life uh, that have uh, that have lives uh, their lives and, and so on and so on. And I think uh, that uh, uh, the spiritual it's a it's a uh, it's a, it's a context of historical meaning the analogical predication. Uh, the problem between uh, the historical or literal sense and the spiritual sense it doesn't cover the uh, analogical predication of uh, some other kinds of predication, but it is. Uh, I, I can I can remind the the small uh, the small uh, uh, the small diagram uh, when the word signifies thing. It's a literal sense. And this signification could be uh, could be analogical. Yeah, it's it's not a problem. But uh, in the case of uh, spiritual says it is think that signifies thing. For example, uh, for example, uh, Isaac's uh, carrying of uh, wood signifies the Christ's carrying of uh, cross, and so on and so on. It means this type of uh, this type of relation uh, couldn't. I'm not a lo lo logician, yeah. So <laughs> I think it is not. There is no place for uh, analogical predication in the spiritual sense. Um, I, I don't know exactly, but thank you very much for a very interesting, very interesting uh, 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 question. And I, I, I must think about it a little bit more. Thank you. If I can ju just react, uh, yeah. I I thought that that you you uh, said that. Uh, the metaphorical sense is not spiritual sense, but literal sense. That yes, means, yes. That means uh, uh, for, for the metaphor, for a metaphor in scripture should, uh, because it can, uh, as if I understand well, it can uh, function as, uh, as a part of syllogistic uh, discourse or yes. syllogistic argument. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So, so, so I think that uh, uh, this uh, metaphorical uh, concept like for example hand in the in the uh, discourse of about God and in, in the discourse about about uh, animals for example uh, there, yeah. there is some analogy so it, mm -hmm. it must be analogical concept but Maybe yeah he yeah. speaks about hand and you think the concept is uh, the words uh, the God's uh, power or God's uh, uh, potence uh, potencia dei it's uh, according to God's arm, and I think it is not about analogical predication. It's only the transitive use of uh, of the word. It means uh, the, the the arm of God is uh, uh, how to say it. In this case, in the, if I can interrupt you, uh, in this case, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, when the Bible speaks about the hand of God or the finger of God, mm -hmm. then uh, if if this uh, Thomist interpretation were right, uh, was right, uh, then uh, the then the, the image of, of a finger of a finger fingers or hand mm -hmm. would have uh, no place in in the understanding of uh, of the biblical verses where it occurs. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it would... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that. Uh... The proper sense is, of course, uh, hand. The proper sense of the word hand is is this part of my body, and the uh, improper or transitive uh, that this uh, part of body uh, uh, can cause some uh, pressure or some activity that is uh, that is effect of my uh, own power. And God's arm or God's God's hand means uh, God's power or God's uh, um, potence or so on and so on. It means. Uh, it is maybe it's it's, it's, a, it's a difference which which Frege later will call the difference between sense and meaning. Mm -hmm. Meaning yeah, 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 yeah. is the thing which is referred to, and the meaning yeah. is uh, yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah. Uh, different. It's something. Yeah. yeah. I, I must a little bit think about. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for this question. It's 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 a very good very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will move now to Richard's answer, and then we have another question from Stefano. So this will follow. Yeah. 
really, really good questions, uh, Peter. Uh, so <clears throat> for my part, um, yes, the, the word God um, is, of course, referring to something unspeakable. So the word God, the word God is already an admission of we are, we, we are, we are speaking about something we don't know what it is, or we can't. So it, that is one way. But <clears throat> the, if if we then take God as a concept, you know, then the turn we have in, I, th I think both in Tomasin and before him in Bruno is that um, uh, the the concept of God is the concept of the one who is revealing himself in in an improper. Uh, in, in improper expressions, yeah. Uh, so, so that, um, so, so that um, God is writing the Bible. God is presenting Himself in in, in nature. <clears throat> God is present in in, in uh, geometrical um, proportions. Um, that all is um, is is um, not only inviting us to. Uh, to look up to the unspeakable, but also is God's way of, in, in other terms, kenosis, God, God's way of descending down to the level that is understandable to humans, for instance, by means of, of nature. Um, it doesn't make, make sense. So what I would emphasize is in uh, Bruno's reading, in Bruno's um, theology, um, he is turning around the um, the ascent uh, perspective uh, that all Neoplatonists have, and so uh, he's turning it around and say, if there is anything we can know, then it must be thanks to the descent of the divine to us, to uh, to the human, uh, to the understandable level. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. But uh, so for Bruno. Uh... It seems to me uh, not only metaphor is all there is uh, in theology and so on, but uh, it seems that negative theology is all there is because I, I think that for him positive theology where where a discourse <clears throat> is possible is for for him something unimaginable <laughs> or I, I don't know uh, how how he would how he would uh, uh, admit that something like a theological argument where there are some premises and some conclusions would be uh, more than a game. Um, yeah, of, of course, his, his uh, discourse is in the, in, in the tradition of negative theology. And of course, he is influenced by uh, Nicholas of Cusa, Ivan Mazzini-Pugino, and, and the Neoplatonists uh, on which they are banking. Um, the, the point is that um, uh, as as um, John Paul would say, he is uh, brewing. He's brewing as much drink as he needs out of his thirst. Thirst, yeah. <laughs> um, that is, he's he's squeezing the, the he's squeezing the uh, lack of knowledge and turning it into knowledge. And and for that reason, he is also um, at least apparently pantheistic, because he has to say. Our way of striving for the absolute is indeed the way the absolute is striving to make itself known to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you very much for the questions and the answers. And now, Stefano, please. <clears throat> Oh, yes. So, first of all, it will bring joy to see you all in person and for sure in, in September. And uh, I have a question for Professor Bloom. I, I read your paper with great interest and, and I and I uh, also fixated on a, on a quote that you have on page five of, of that draft. It would be uh, the one from the Lampa de Combinatoria. This is note uh, footnote number 12. And, and that is where Bruno uses the analogical treatment of metaphors and he says assumptas metaphora seu translaciones 
Um, so that that is a piece that struck me because you can find a lot of parallels in the in the tradition of rhetoric uh, uh, used in the religious orders, particularly uh, compilations of how to preach, how to write sermons. So at this stage, uh, I, I assume that there is a lot of uh, the metaphor is an engine of copia. So that's what it does. And, and I just, I found a quote that I wanted to read out to you because of, of, of this similarity. This comes from uh, uh, a derazione concionandi, which at some point says, and I quote, uh, metaphoras seu translaciones, tropos, exempla, historias et similitudines. So clearly, the, 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 this is something that I think suggests that Bruno is is uh, um, is doing something tricky. Is is moving into the pictorial, and he uses fidias, and he goes into a pelles uh, right after. But really, is is taking uh, materials that come from uh, uh, rather like agricola idea of topo. You know, the idea that metaphors are. Uh, instruments to produce this kind of um, copia, copiousness in, in the rhetorical order. So that's the, the first thing. The other um, uh, comment on the same quote is of proportionality. Um, on the same page in your paper, you write uh, proporciones. Um, and this is something, although I don't deny that obviously with Bruno, we have to go with Neoplatonist and you know, the, the whole genealogy. But it's also uh, interesting to think about Aristotle here because uh, there is a passage in the Generazione Animalium where Aristotle marvels at bees um, and, and the key term there, I don't have the passage with me, but the key term is proportionality. The, what, what strikes Aristotle is that bees have three orders, so you have kinship, uh, there's there's a, the the higher B, and then you have warriors, you have uh, economic uh, people, uh, bees who attend to economics and sexual reproduction, and so the, this for for Aristotle he says there's something divine about that, and he uses a term that was translated in Latin in, in the same way that your quote is operating, so proportiona, proportionalis, pro, pro, proportiones, and so on. So that's that's the uh, that, that's the end of you know this uh, uh, similitudes, and finally, if I may just a, a final question is um, uh, so far in the in in the draft that i read uh bloomenberg is almost like a deus ex machina no it comes at the end and you and you say it's he talks about absolute metaphors and i don't i think this is a good idea but I also wonder uh, why not using him before? Um, because uh, Blumenberg also wrote through metaphors, right? We have at the Bibliothèque Nationale, we have boxes like a hundred and, and, and uh, boxes of, of uh, quotes that he assembled. I, I don't know the German term for that, but uh, they, probably the French would call it fish, uh, you know, those, those uh, cards, notes. And he, he assembled thousands of them. So again, there, I think there is a structural similarity in the method of work of Bruno and the method of work of, of Blumenberg, which you may um, explore, you know, in in a, in a further uh, version. And that, that anyway. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano. Uh, Richard, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks. That that's full of, full of ideas. So um, let, let me start with the with the Blumenberg thing. Uh, yeah, well, um, when I was trying to explain it to myself, what Bruno is doing, I can of course, I remembered uh, Blumenberg, uh, whom I had read many, many years ago, and I, and I uh, pulled it out of my, out of my shelf, and found, yes, indeed, I, my, my memory was correct. He is describing something uh, with the absolute metaphor, he's describing something that Bruno is trying to do, and um, and he refers to also, he also refers to Bruno, but especially to Nic Nicholas of Cusa. Now, a paper on Blumenberg's metaphorology and its predecessors would be a book, or would be at least another another thing. And and you're you're absolutely right. The uh, enormous collection of um, of instances, of references, and so on, that Bruno has in his mind. Um, Bloomberg had that in his basement in uh, in his Katai custom. Yeah, <laughs> and and that is that is that is famous. Um, so okay, that, that so far. 
the the um, uh, the, the the question about proper proportion. <clears throat> yeah, that is a similar question as um, as Peter had for uh, Thomas uh, regarding analogy. Um, met uh, metaphorically speaking, um, this way or that way has always to do with analogy and analogy has to be proportionate because otherwise it is not understandable. And in, uh, in, in this case here, which I quoted from the Lampa, uh, the Lampa de Combinatoria, um, the, um, the thing is that he is um, uh, referring to uh, poets and prophets. Yeah, poets, poets and prophets have to use uh, have to use um, uh, metaphorical language, translations, uh, comparisons, similitudinous uh, proportion, proportions, and, and also then negations in the sense of making clear what is being negated. Yeah, which then, by the way, also comes close to negative theology because that's what negative theology, among others, does. Yeah, it says uh, God is not, and then comes a list of things. God is not, and that makes clear what God is in an approximate way. So yes, um, th that is clear. The, the other thing is um, Bruno is, of course, um, interested in, um, in a, uh, say, in a rational theology, or in some kind of theology, uh, but here he is referring to poets. And the interesting thing is that um, already before, um, in, in the, uh, among the humanists, um, I'm uh, remembering uh, uh, Boccaccio and, uh, and Salutati, but also Dante. Um, <clears throat> before that, if Dante is a Renaissance author, um, people applied the um, the the, um, the the metaphorical interpretation um, the, uh, <clears throat> of uh, or the the four senses interpretation. Of the Bible, they imply, applied that also to poetry and to um, uh, and, and to secular or, or say pagan uh, sources. In the case of Salutati, to the uh, stories of of, Her of Heracles. So mm -hmm. uh, the the funny thing is you have you have a non you have a non existing um, reality, which is used as a metaphor for something that the poet wants to express, and and again. Uh, and Bruno speaks about that. The question is, uh, how do we distinguish uh, foolish metaphors from real good met metaphors? I hope that is addressing your question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Acteon hunt is really a Boccaccian metaphor, not the, the hunt for, yeah, that's, uh, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. I see another hand uh, of, of Simon Barton. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed both papers, but I had a question for Tomasz, um, which was, uh, um, do, do Aquinas and the, um, the early modern uh, Thomas Dominican commentators make any kind of explicit connections between um, scripture, the senses of scripture and divine ideas? I, I was very intrigued by the quote um, from Cayetan that all senses of scripture are one in the divine mind and, and it just I know the Franciscans make lots of connections between scripture, the divine ideas, and the Trinity, and I'm just intrigued if you see that in the, the kind of uh, Aquinas, Dominicans, and the sense of scripture debate. Thank you. In the context of the scriptural senses, uh, there is a commentary of uh, Cayetan that uh, in the good mind, uh, there is the unity uh, of his intellect. Uh, to, sp to speak about divine ideas is a mode of speaking of our human knowledge. This is impossible for us. It is impossible for us to grasp everything in one idea uh, as good as possible uh, to, to, to know it. So uh, we must think about God in uh, many ideas and we must think about God's simple idea of everything uh, also in many ideas, uh, but it is not. Uh, it is it is the important part of argumentation uh, that uh, uh, in God's mind, 
everything, both literal and uh, uh, metaphorical, or literary, proper literal, metaphorical literal, and the spiritual service, they are only one, uh, one comprehensive uh, idea. But in our uh, thinking, uh, in our style of, uh, of our understanding, uh, there is necessity, and this is propter utilitatum and necessitatum, the using of metaphors uh, in accordance. Uh, it is necessary to think in a many senses, to divide things in, in some kind of this and that. And that. But uh, the tract of uh, divine ideas is uh, uh, the other tract uh, in the Summa Theologia or treaties of, or, 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 or is, is a different part of Summa. It's, it's, uh, it is not very far because I think it's it's uh, uh, really close to the, uh, it's in the first part of the Summa in the beginning, but I think there is no uh, strict and uh, uh, necessary connections, <laughs> uh, to say the uh, human language, uh, between uh, the, the part of uh, using of metaphors in, uh, in the theology and in the scripture, and, uh, uh, and in, because uh, Aquinas' treatise about God's uh, divine ideas is a part of uh, uh, part of theology about God. It is not about the methodology, about uh, our epistemology, or about the uh, theology as such. Is, is it enough? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. No, that makes sense, and and it explains the kind of um, the parallel with the discussion of divine attributes and and, and as you say, ideas. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I have actually uh, perhaps two questions for, for Tomáš as well. Um, the first one, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Nicolas of Lyra, who, who discussed uh, uh, metaphor in a, in a different, uh, different context than, than the Thomistic uh, tradition, um, as uh, he considered metaphor as being spiritual instead of literal and 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 he was criticized by Vasquez and and my uh, question is whether uh, whether there war was any broader de debate about about this problem in uh, in the early modern period whether there were some some uh, uh, some articulated followers of, of Nicolas of Lyra on, on, on this very aspect. And, and my second question uh, relates to, to uh, what, you've, uh, what you've said about Bagnes and his, his discussion of uh, uh, whether, whether metaphor is acceptable for, for application in science uh, like theology. And uh, the question is whether the authors like Ariaga, for example, or, or uh, Bagnes uh, discussed the, the, the more general question, whether, whether metaphor is acceptable for science in general, not only theology, but the broader issues of usage of, of usage of metaphor in in other disciplines of the period. So these are my two questions. Well, thank you. I will begin the, uh, with the second question because I think it's uh, uh, it it is not complicated because uh, uh, it can be used in theology or metaphor can be used in theology because theology is a normal kind of science. It means it can be used in science. But we are interested in a theology now, so that we are speaking about theology. Uh, but the core of this argument is uh, science as such. And it is Aristotelian science. It, it means uh, it's uh, one of the intellectual virtues uh, that can be uh, found. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a perfect knowledge that uh, consists in a relation of causes and effects. Yeah, we know uh, what and we know why. Uh, and uh, this uh, this uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, proprium of every science, including theology. Uh, theology is a special kind of science, uh, but uh, it is not uh, 
uh, similar to our discussion. Uh, there is a, a huge discussion about scientific character of theology in, uh, in the uh, early modern period. It is not connected with, uh, with the dignity of theology or it, because uh, a view that, that distinguishes the scientific and uh, stupid or, uh, uh, for example, in a neo-positivic sense, it's a metaphysical, it means the, the garbage and now this is the science and it's, it's a good, it's, it's completely new and it is not the case of uh, the discussions of uh, science in uh, medieval and early modern discussions. Uh, the problem is that um, uh, theology is under, uh, theology in Aquinas uh, understanding uh, depends, human theology depends on theology of God. It means our knowledge depends, but the principles of this theology are in God's uh, mind, in divine mind. So that uh, it is it is the question, is it possible or not? In our earthly sciences, for example, uh, the idea of, of ideas of mathematician uh, are principles for the ideas of uh, a physicist or uh, or a natural philosopher in, in general, uh, but they are, both of them are human, despite there are two subjects, one person and the second person. But it's in, on the human level. But a scientific character of or scientific uh, nature of theology uh, is um, explained by the relationship of human knowledge uh, that is uh, the, that is. Um, uh, um, that could be traced into the ideas in human mind. The causes are in human mind because we are not able to grasp uh, God's essence in a full comprehensive, one full comprehensive idea. Uh, so that it was the problem of scientific knowledge. But uh, the using of metaphor, uh, it's not the special case of theology and of our sciences. It's a science as such, including theology. Yeah? Okay, and, but but the sorry, but the, the the let me let me um, react. But the but 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 the of course, if if you speak about metaphor under the heading of literal sense of mm -hmm. scripture, mm -hmm. it's a it's a different function of the metaphor than perhaps in other disciplines, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe there are some discipline there. There are no metaphors because uh, it's not uh, because it is not necessary to uh, to use them. But in theology, the principles of theology that are uh, contained in the Holy Scripture are very oftenly uh, expressed by meta metaphors. So that we must uh, we must ask if this uh, type of uh, speaking is proper to the science. And maybe in other type of science, uh, there would be no such question. But principally, it is, uh, it is possible to use metaphors in science, but it is not necessary in every kind of science because there is no, uh, no fundamental text that is principle for the science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I understand, but, but, but the question was whether there was any discussion in, in the works of Ariaga, for example, of the utility uh, of metaphors, for example, in mm, yeah, yeah, in, uh, maybe maybe um, it is not discussed in uh, the commentaries uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Aquinas in the Summa because uh, there is uh, such a big question from the beginning of Summa. It's a scientific uh, character of theology and. Uh, things that are related with it, but I think it is possible. But I, but I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. It is possible that it is uh, discussed in uh, the logical uh, commentaries, especially for second analytics. Uh, it is it is very difficult to speak about uh, second scholasticism or early modern scholasticism because it's a huge number of texts that are uh, that are uh, only in the old prints. And uh, it's uh, uh, it is uh, mostly it is uh, uh, it, it is not uh, not uh, uh, explored uh, enough uh, to have a lot of uh, secondary literature. For example, we have a good secondary literature, for example, of, of natural law in the second scholasticism, or in some uh, in some special kinds of metaphysical questions. Uh, but mm. 
I, I'm not sure. For example, uh, Jesuits in Coimbra, Coimbra census, they discussed or they commented not Aquinas but Aristotle. It, it was such an exception. It is. It was more common uh, to comment Aris, uh, Aquinas in the in the early modern per period than uh, uh, and not not Aristotle. Aristotle was commented especially in the medieval period. But uh, but uh, I think I, I don't know. But I think if it is uh, it is uh, present uh, in their writings, it will. I think it will not be. It is not in uh, the commentaries. To Aquinas, but uh, in some special logical treatises or to, in commentaries to Aristotle. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Or in and polemics, I of course. The first question. I forgot the first. Uh, the first question uh, was related to Nicolas of Lyra and uh -huh. and uh, whether there was any uh, broader continuation in this discussion. Uh, he he was uh, he was a Franciscan, and it must be said that. Uh, these two streams, or sometimes it is said that there are three uh, uh, most important uh, streams or schools in the early modern scholasticism. It's a uh, Thomistic, Jesuit, and Franciscan. And uh, uh, Jesuit uh, is uh, very close to Thomistic, uh, and uh, they commented Aquinas, not Scotus, and so on and so on. But uh, in fact, Jesuit uh, stream is something between uh, in the style of thinking between uh, Franciscans uh, or between Scotists and Thomists. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Nicolas of Lira was a Franciscan philosopher uh, or theologian. Uh, he, was, uh, he was medieval uh, or highly medieval uh, author in the beginning, the first half of 14th century. It, mo it means uh, uh, it would be, maybe it, he is, discussed among the Franciscan uh, commentators. And I frankly say, I, I do not know a lot, um, uh, very deeply in the Franciscan context, but in the uh, second scholasticism discussions, uh, there are some, some authors. Uh, it was uh, uh, Alonso Tostado, for example, it's author from the 15th century. And it's a, it's a, a Renaissance, or it could be uh, early modern or not, Renaissance uh, author. Uh, and uh, he is discussed uh, with this such uh, position. He, he is not so strict as Nicholas was because uh, he he, uh, uh, he has uh, some uh, mixed idea that is close both to Nicholas and to Aquinas, and that's why uh, Vasquez uh, criticized him that he is uh, he contradicts himself. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's inconsistent thinking, uh, but. In common, uh, it is not. It is not very common to to find such uh, such expositions, such such I think misunderstanding, because uh, it was uh, the Aquinas uh, understanding of uh, of literal sense and metaphor as a kind of literal sense was uh, was just common idea, common common sentence. I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I was asking the first question, having in mind, for example, you know, the mm, polemical exchange between Ariaga and Marcus Marzi, for example, as uh, I don't know, I, I, I haven't studied it in detail and, and uh, um, at all with regard to metaphors, but I can imagine that uh, such, a, such a polemic between two very different authors uh, who um, who uh, followed very different philosophical traditions could provoke also some ideas about how they used and how they understood metaphors in uh, in science or in, in in scholarly in scholarly discourse. Okay, thank you. I do not see any any other. Um, hand raised. So does it mean that there is no other comment or, or question? Oh, I see one, perhaps. Uh, no, probably not. That was probably a mistake. 
Okay. So if there is no no more, yeah, there is there is. Uh, uh, Sorry. Yes. There is one. There is one. Okay. That was me. <laughs> Sorry, Lenka. Yes. Yes, I try it. Um, I mean that um, the distinction between literal and metaphorical reading um, of Bible was crucial for the whole theory of metaphor. So I'm glad that we are started just with these two presentations today, because it's a um, really good base and good starting point for our debate. Um, I have one question for uh, Mr. Makula that are related to the metaphor discourse of the next centuries. Um, when Aquinas distinguishes between literal and non-literal meanings, um, is it a purely technical classification or does he express also some critical judgment about the nature of metaphor? Are there also some um, signs of criticism, something that suggests that metaphorical ex expressions has some cognitive limits, um, simply something reminiscent of the um, critic of metaphor we know, we, we know um, especially um, from the 17th century. Thank you very much. Aquinas uh, speaks about metaphor, not I think he doesn't use the word metaphor. He speaks about parabolical sense, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, I think, and it is not a big topic for him. It is not a, a, a hot, hot topic for discussion of his times. Uh, it is um, uh, he he uh, try to uh, try to distinguish, especially between uh, the uh, spiritual sense, and it is important for him, especially for his. Uh, exegesis or understanding of Old Testament, yeah. how to and his his treatise of Old Testament is, is is really in the Summa. In the Summa, it is in the uh, first part of the second part, and it's uh, prima secunda, and it is really large and very deep. And uh, he he uh, under he he, he understands uh, the Old Testament as a very important part of the, of, of of Bible, uh, but. Uh, uh, he he doesn't he doesn't uh, discuss metaphor as such, and he uh, didn't develop an, any uh, special theory of uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this uh, the theory of language and the uh, express uh, language expressions was not his uh, primary topic uh, and question. Mm -hmm. uh, because there was one interesting note in your paper, mm -hmm. um, metaphors work as a veil protecting divine revelation from unworthy people, unbelievers. Yeah, um, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was, uh, it's, um, it's some kind, it, it, this note, uh, it's something uh, that, uh, uh, that has its beginning in the old uh, Disciplina Arcani. Uh, some things uh, are uh, some parts of Christian faith, and not only faith, also some liturgy, for example, uh, is not accessible, are not accessible, or should not be accessible for people who are uh, not insiders. Yeah, so that uh, the, not, not only unbelievers, but also catechumens, uh, people before their baptism, were uh, uh, moved out of uh, the church when the holy mystery was uh, was celebrated, and it is it is uh, uh, it is um, uh, similar also with some parts of Christian doctrine. Uh, up today, uh, there is some uh, in the church. There is some uh, special right of uh, giving, for example, of uh, uh, give, uh, uh, con confession, uh, the credo, uh, the, the, what should Christian belief, and it, now it is purely symbolic because everybody can uh, find it in the libraries and internet and so on, but in the first church, in the, in the early church, it was the special rite, and it was, it was a very important thing. And Aquinas, uh, comments this uh, uh, the holy veil of metaphor as a, a kind of this uh, disciplina arcani. It is it is better to to be a little bit uh, unclear because we know what does it mean, and the people who can laugh it and who can re 
uh, to be ridiculous for them. Uh, they do not know exactly so that uh, the mystery is protected. But I think it is not so important because in Aquinas times it was uh, uh, the high medieval period. Uh, the Christianity was uh, completely um, a public thing and it, not, it was not a secret thing in the first centuries of uh, persecuted church in Rome in the Roman Empire. Yeah. But, but yeah, 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 it's just a very good note. Thank you very much. It's, it's a part of this Disciplina Arcani and it's, it's also, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's 10 to 7. I think we we will end here. And uh, thank you thank you all for participating in this uh, in this opening uh, first meeting. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank thank thanks to both speakers and thanks to all listeners and those who discussed. Uh, I hope we will meet uh, next week uh, again, Thursday, five o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, if I remember well, um, we will have uh, two speakers uh, next week. Uh, one is Simon Barton uh, and the second one is uh, Mm. Sorry, I forgot now, uh, but I will send you. <laughs> I will send you a program, and uh, um, okay. So I'm looking forward to see you all next week. I hope to circulate the both papers tomorrow, so you will receive them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.